I am still here with Jesse Fuel, and uh, we haven't moved, folks. We haven't moved. <laughs> We're sitting in the same spots here. But Jesse and I decided that the three topics that we have and want to talk to you about, we wanted to break them up into two interviews. So first we talked about Big Agile and now we're moving on to the software extension to the PIMBOK guide and also to Can You Hear Me Now? You hear more about that in the second part of this interview here. So Jesse, welcome back. Thank you for uh, continuing to <laughs> sit here to sit here and chat. <laughs> uh, we're having a good time, so yeah, we might as you. well keep it going. Yeah, thank you. All right, so the software extension to the PIMBOK guide. What was your role on this? I was part of the core team uh, that was headed by uh, Dr. Dick Fairley from the IEEE Computer Society, and then uh, the uh, the vice chair from uh, the PMI, my colleague Dennis Stevens. All and right, I was. Uh, they ran the team, which was a joint effort between the PMI and the IEEE Computer Society, and I was part of that core team. When did it come out? About a month ago, in um, September of 2013. It's been out for a month. You can buy it on Amazon and the PMI Marketplace. Um, member PMI members in good standing can download a free copy from the website. I'll get oh, yeah, my free copy then. Question. When I hear PIMBOK guide and software extension, you know, I'm thinking, okay, is this another academic text that when I read it, I feel, okay, this is now so dry, I have to read it three or four times in order to understand it? Um, I'm going to say a little bit, yeah, maybe. Maybe, yeah. <laughs> okay. um, it is absolutely a, it is a standard. It is a standard. It is yeah. not intended as an entertaining book. No, it's not, right. uh, it's not, it's not the uh, Harry Potter of project management, if you will. <laughs> it's, uh, it's, it's pretty, it's uh, pretty academic, especially when you think about the brain power that was brought to bear on, on, on the problem at hand. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's a process book for, for, process, uh, for process people. Okay. What does it teach me? Well, the problem that I um, somewhat alluded to is that the PIMBOK guide is often misinterpreted depending on the context the project manager is working in. PMI has already launched um, specific extensions that are industry-specific. PMI has already launched industry-specific extensions to the PIMBOK guide for example, the government extension um, is um, a set of practices and recommendations about how to implement scope management in a government environment. Or construction is another one of the extensions that offers specific advice on how to implement risk management in a construction environment. And there's been a number of people in the software and information technology community who believe strongly that the common interpretation of the PMBOK guide in the software field is problematic at times. There's a great quote by uh, Fred Books in um, his classic, uh, The Mythical Man Month, where he said something along the lines of, in many respects, um, project management in a software context is very similar to project management in any other context, but in many respects, it is not. <laughs> so that was the mission about why we put it together. And yeah, that was the mission why we put it together. How thick is it? <laughs> it's, uh, it's a couple of hundred pages. Okay. Uh, it'll, it'll definitely uh, take some time to, to read through it. Uh, what w we opened it up for public comment to the entire project management community with um, almost uh, 2,000 comments of recommendations. Not surprising, uh, yeah. yeah. Um, but what we noticed is that the volume of comments started to get thinner and thinner and thinner the deeper and deeper into the book you uh, got. So page 190 had the fewest comments. <laughs> yes, yes. yes. <laughs> so it's, it's a pretty dense read. But the key of it is that there's, there's, there's just a lot of good recommendations in the material. Tell me a little bit about those recommendations. What will they recommend? Well, the, uh, the key pattern uh, that you'll see is the elaboration of the continuum of project life cycles that's defined in the fifth edition of the PMBOK guide, whereby um, this, this notion that you can you either plan-driven and waterfall or you're adaptive and agile is, is put on its head. And in the, the fifth edition of the PMBOK guide, there was defined a continuum, a spectrum, a a very sliding scale between two extremes. And the choice of life cycle that you're going to bring to a project is very much context-driven. 
And um, each of the 10 knowledge areas, scope management, um, time management, risk management, stakeholder management, offer concrete examples of how to implement those knowledge areas within a given context of either being very plan-driven or being very adaptive or somewhere in the middle. Okay. Since it's an extension to the PIMBOK guide, it's project management focused. So should project managers read this or should technical software developers read this? Who is it for? It is. It really is for uh, people who are intended to help with the coordination of projects. Um, software engineers who are interested in, in process might get some value out of it. Senior executives who have some interest in how to operationalize uh, some some standard project competencies would be interested in it. But it is it is very much for project leaders and process leaders who are looking to, um, as I said, operationalize some some uh, best practices. And how much does agile play in? To ah, the book. Excellent because the question. PIMBOK guide mentions Agile a couple of times, but it doesn't go into detail. Yes. And what we what the committee what the committee uh, started uh, discussing based on the, the comments from the community is that Agile is such an overloaded word that it was best to attack it from a different angle. And the different angle is to was to say that there um, there are different aspects of agility. And we're going to talk about some of those aspects in different chapters of the book. We'll talk about maybe an adaptive approach to uh, scope management or an adaptive approach to risk management. But we intentionally stop short of defining what Agile is. Many of us believe that the Agile movement already has a formal definition at uh, agilemanifesto.org. That is the official definition of what the Agile movement is about. But if you want to start talking about specific practices and techniques that are available to project managers, well, those are, those are usually based upon what you have to do in the moment. What job am I doing? Am I defining, um, am I defining a, the scope for a project? Am I defining a schedule? Well, then I'm going to go to that chapter and I'm going to look at techniques about how to do that for that specific situation. There was, um, there's one area that defines um, that the Agile movement is focused on the notion of collaboration teams. And what are some of the attributes of collaboration teams? They're fully dedicated, they're cross-functional, they're co-located, they're multi-skilled. Um, and, and so what we said was that there's, there's a commonality of these patterns within those projects that are said to implement Agile methods. But again, st stopping short of a formal definition. Okay. Is there anything in this software extension that you personally found surprising? The, what did I personally find um, surprising? What I found surprising working with the committee was the different interpretations of terminology that people brought to bear. Um, one of the examples in, uh, in software is that what, what do you call the act of building software? Is it construction? Is it coding? Is it development? Is it implementation? And so um, what was surprising to me, what I learned was that there is a whole body of standards that's been defined by the IEEE about what to call these things and how to do them. And so there was a specific standard in the, um, that we cited and we said, we are going to call these different stages of software project work, analysis, architecture, construction, integration, test. Those are the terms that we're gonna use. It was surprising to me. It was, uh, was eye-opening as to how much is out there in the community that I just, I wasn't privy to. Uh, and 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 for that reason, it was it was pretty rewarding. All right, I'm a project manager. I am running a project with let's stick with the numbers here. 700 people are on my project. Uh, yes. It's a software development project. What will reading the software extension to the Pinbot Guide help me do? It will give you perspective. I think that one of the the challenges of a modern project manager today is that I'm being inundated with so much noise. How do I integrate? How do I synthesize all of this, all of this conversation about um, this methodology versus that technique and this process? And by pulling to all of that together in a single standard that provides a nice um, structured layout of the material that can be consumed depending on what particular topic you're looking at, whether it's risk or scope or time. So I think that's that's the value that you would get out of it is just being able to synthesize a lot of the conversation in a structured fashion. And what is the one thing out of these 200 pages in the software extension to the Pinbot Guide that you'd say, 
as a software development project manager. This is the one thing you really have to do. It's, as a software project manager, you have to embrace the unknown. Because uh, unlike with government work or construction work in the software world, there's a lot in, in, in this particular document, there's a lot of conversation about thought work and knowledge work. Um, that's the phrase that was popularized by uh, Peter Drucker. The knowledge worker is dealing in abstractions and unknowns and unknown unknowns. And uh, we use the term in a document called dark matter. And so be comfortable with uncertainty and um, use some of the tricks in the document about how to triangulate some, contain some of that uncertainty as you move forward in a project. All right, perfect. And as you have heard, folks, if you are a PMI member in good standing, go get your PDF copy and start reading. So it's 200 pages long, and from those 200 pages, we are moving to 66 pages that actually fit into the palm of my hand right <laughs> here. It is a little booklet titled, Can You Hear Me Now? Working with Global Distributed Virtual Teams, and is written by none other than Jesse Fuel. Tell me yes. a little bit about this. How did it come to be? I'm really excited about this project. A friend of mine, a very dear colleague of mine by the name of Dana Wright, introduced me to a public speaker, um, Haley Foster. And Haley is the short talk expert, and she wrote a little mini book uh, on, on uh, her topic. And her mini book was uh, How uh, Don't uh, ta Tank Your TED Talk. And it was, what was really appealing, beyond the fact that Haley is a rock star and the book itself is an absolute gem, was the format. It's a t like you said, it's the size of a, it's the size of a smartphone. It is 67 pages of 5,000, 6,000 words compared to the average nonfiction textbook, which is 100,000 words. It's the, uh, what I like to call the ultimate agile implementation of a book. <laughs> it's smaller. I did it faster. I wrote it over the course of a weekend, but it's a full and proper book. And I was guided through the whole process by the printer, which is called Minibook. Uh, and you can learn more about them at uh, Minibook, M-I-N-I-B-U-K dot com. They're a fantastic self-publishing organization that just walked me through it. And for a fraction of the cost of traditional self-publishing, I now have something that tells my, uh, a little story, and it's in a small digestible size. All right. Let's make it even smaller for our listeners. In okay. a nutshell, what will we learn from your mini book? Can You Hear Me Now? Working with global uh, distributed virtual teams is about the trend where, um, contrary to the desires of agile enthusiasts, Everybody that needs to work on a project simply is not in the office. Whether people are working from home, whether we're talking to our offshore partner, or we're talking to headquarters on the other side of the coast, we have to coordinate with people outside the office more and more in modern work. And there's, uh, there's a surprising number of small startups um, uh, that are thriving in a pure virtual environment. And we're learning, taking some of those tips and tricks and applying them to the rest of us, um, applying them in a way that the rest of us can use. All right. And from these 67 pages, what is the number one thing that you recommend that our listeners do when they're working with global distributed virtual teams? One of the chapters is about communication. And many of us as project managers have been trained that communication is the number one engine to successful projects. Communicate, communicate, communicate. So whether it's through a, a highly managed travel budget or high fidelity video conferencing or translation tools that are embedded in email or as a part of your uh, IN chat, whatever tools you're bringing to bear, over communication is just simply, is just simply not there's no such thing as too much communication. Yeah. So that's the number one nugget is uh, d um, put your assumptions to the side and verify and re-verify and re-communicate. Excellent. Once again, the mini book is called Can You Hear Me Now? Working with Global Distributed Virtual Teams written by Jesse Fuel. And you can find more about it on jessefuel.com. Jesse, thanks for being here. Thank you. It was a lot of fun. <laughs>